welcome to our worship this morning on this Passion Sunday, the fifth Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ your Son our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Today's reading from the letter to the Hebrews says how God made Jesus the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And also how Jesus was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. I'd like to explore this reference to the priest Melchizedek and see what we can learn from it. We need to remember that this letter to the Hebrews was written by someone steeped in the Jewish scriptures to a Jewish, possibly priestly audience. And thus it includes themes which would, have reson which would not have resonated with Gentile converts of the time. However, if we unpack it, there's a lot to learn. In making this exploration, I'd like to ask three questions. Who was Melchizedek? What does he tell us about Jesus? And what does this mean for us? So who was Melchizedek? He only appears three times in scripture, and yet he is a significant figure. We first meet him 2,000 years before Christ in Genesis 14, in the time of Abraham. 
Then a thousand years later, he is referred to in one of David's Psalms. And then here he is in chapter 5 of Hebrews. And then in more detail, two chapters later, in Hebrews 7. Let me read the three verses from Genesis 14. After Abram returned from defeating Kedelamor and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Although it's only three verses, there's a lot there that we can note. Melchizedek appears as one almost out of time, eternal. Unlike most people of significance in the scriptures, there is no record of where he comes from, no genealogy, and we know nothing of his later life or death. As Hebrews 7 says, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Secondly, we see that he is the first recorded priest in the scriptures. In Hebrew, a priest is a Kohen. I tend to think of Old Testament priests as sacerdotes, which is the Latin. And we also tend to apply the Roman role of someone who performs a ritual like a sacrifice. However, it appears that the function of a Kohen in the Middle East was primarily to declare God's blessing on people. And we see Melchizedek do that to Abram. Note the names. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And also king of Salem means king of peace. Salem is of course Jerusalem, where much of Jewish history is played out worth noting that Melchizedek is both a king and a priest. Nowhere in the history of Israel does the same person fulfil both functions. When he comes out to bless Abraham, he brings out bread and wine. It is thought by scholars that that reflects and is a precursor to Holy Communion, the Eucharist. Melchizedek predates the whole history of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Notice that it talks about Abram, which means that it is before God makes his covenant with Abraham. Abram gives a tithe of the spoils of his battle to Melchizedek, which means that he acknowledges that Melchizedek is superior to him. This, in turn, means that he is also superior to all the priests of Israel who are descended from Abraham. There are many scholarly th theories as to who Melchizedek was. Some suggest that this is a, an appearance of Christ himself. Others suggest that it was Shem, the son of Noah, who, according to the record, would still have been alive at this time. That would be intriguing, as it would take us back to the flood and the idea of a new start, which I will come to later. However, I prefer the idea that he is a mystery figure without beginning or end. So we now jump forward a thousand years from the time of Abraham to that of King David. Note that David was the first king of Israel to designate Jerusalem as his capital. He was the king of Salem. 
David was famous for writing many of the Psalms. And when he came to write Psalm 110, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, he wrote, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Remember, as we hear in the Christmas readings, that David is foretold to be an ancestor of the Messiah. The Messiah is described as being of David's line. This leads me to my second question. What does Melchizedek tell us about Jesus? As we know, Jesus was descended from King David and thus fulfilled that aspect of the prophecy. We also remember from the birth narrative the story of the Magi, who brought gifts, their three gifts, to the infant Jesus, gold, frankincense and myrrh, symbols that the child would grow up to be a king, a priest and a sacrificial victim. Jesus fulfilled all those on the cross. Let's look at the points we drew out about Melchizedek from the Genesis reading. We noted that he was both king and priest, which nobody in the history of Israel had ever been. Jesus also was both king and priest, the king of kings and the priest who brought God's blessing to people and the priest performing the ritual of the once-for-all sacrifice for sin of himself on the cross. We noted that Melchizedek was like one out of time, eternal. Jesus is the one out of time, eternal, existing from eternity to eternity. Furthermore, Melchizedek brought out bread and wine, and we noted that this prefigured Jesus' institution of the Last Supper, the Holy Communion. In giving Melchizedek a tithe, Abraham acknowledged his superiority. And in Jesus we have a high priest who is infinitely superior to Abraham and to any of the priests of Israel who descended from Abraham. Melchizedek predated God's covenant with Abraham and thus the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross presided over by the high priest of the order of Melchizedek benefits all humankind and not just the descendants of Abraham. We have seen that Jesus fulfills all the requirements of being a priest of the order of Melchizedek. So let's look at the third question. What does that mean for us? The main theme that I would wish to draw out, which will come out further when we look at the resurrected Jesus on Easter morning, is that in Jesus, God is doing something new. The prophet Isaiah said, Behold, I am doing a new thing. And in Jesus, God does. Today's set Old Testament reading from the prophet Jeremiah declares the Old Covenant with Abraham and his descendants to be dead and says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. And he does that in Jesus. When Jesus goes to his death on the cross, he is the sacrifice for the sins of all people not just the people of Israel. And that sacrifice is presided over by a completely different type of priest to those who had presided over the sacrifices of the Mosaic law. History tells us that 40 years after the death of Jesus, the Romans raised the Jerusalem temple to the ground, which marked the end of the Jewish sacrificial system. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, there was no longer any need for the old type of sacrifice. The old covenant, with its priests and sacrifices, was dead. So to conclude, 
as we go through the events of Holy Week and Easter. Let us wonder at this new thing that God has done in Jesus. How he has restored all things. How all people are now able, through faith, to be reconciled to him. Let us wonder. And let us respond in faith and worship. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. May God, who from the death of sin raised you to new life in Christ, keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.